the series on joy as I go through the, the scripture on what God considers joyful. You know, I was thinking the joy of worship, the joy of the word, the joy of fellowship, the joy of service, the joy of prayer, the joy of suffering and persecution. That's in the Bible. The joy of a heaven-bound life and so on and so forth. It just is amazing to me that the Christian life is a joy-filled experience. And I've gone to so many sources where it talks about the joy of the believer. You know, we get joyful when we do this. We joyfully worship God. We joyfully respond. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoices. Paul's command to the Philippians and and yet it was interesting as I went through the, the references on joy, I also saw a lot of references to the joy of the Lord, period. That it's one of His great attributes. And I would go so far as to call it one of His great attributes. It's never listed in a book on attributes. I was searching that and never found any information, but... As I searched my concordance and as I looked in Scripture, I saw that God is a God of joy. And I find it odd because as you read through the Bible, joy seems to permeate every aspect of God's person, plans, and program. And it, it, it's just amazing to see how much joy is in the Bible and yet, it's not listed among his main attributes, which bothered me somewhat. You know, Psalm 1611 says, you will, you will make known to me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The very, very throne of God is saturated with the joy of God. To be in his presence is to be immersed in his joy and, and it's kind of an interesting thing that we don't seem to be immersed in his joy. A lot of people say most churches look like they're weaned on dill pickles when we should be. And I'm not talking about a giddiness or just a smile on your face. I'm talking about a deep inner joy that knows the God who is the source of all joy as we're going to see. In Job 38, when God is instructing Job, and Job, we were singing about that a little bit, and he says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? Tell me if you have understanding." Since you know, and God is being sarcastic here. Certain amount of sarcasm in this. And he says, where were you since you know when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, referring to the angels as they watched the creative power of God. They were created before the earth. And, and as they're watching the creative power of God unfold, they just burst forth in, in joy to the joyous might and power of God. You see, the creation was wrought and hammered out and spoken into existence amid the, the mighty, joyous power of God as the angels shouted for joy as they were caught up in the joy of the Almighty as they rejoiced in His awesome, infinite strength. You know, Proverbs 8, sort of referring to that, speaking of our mighty Christ and His mighty wisdom, says, Then I was beside Him as a master workman, and I was daily His delight, rejoicing always before Him. Rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. And here you see Christ, as Colossians 1 tells us, being the creator of all things and the sustainer of life. And, and he's at the right hand of the Father and they are creating and daily they're just delighting in what they're creating. It's amazing. This is reflected in Genesis 1.31 when it says, And God saw all that he had made. And behold, it was very good. Not just good, but very good. And you can just imagine the joy of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as they look upon what they had created and the pristine purity and power and beauty of all of it. And they're rejoicing together in it. Because they're the source of all joy. But then came the fall. And the rebellion of man into sin. And the promise of a Messiah who would come through the seed of the woman, through the seed of Abraham, through the nation of Israel, through the tribe of Judah, through the line of David. And in the Gospels, he came to the shepherds and he was announced 
Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. And who is that great joy? Well, the one who is the personification of all joy, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And apart from Him, there is no joy in this world. All man has to look forward to is a life, and then death, and then an eternity of hell. We don't mention that much, and we don't talk about death. It seems to be a taboo subject, or we don't talk much about hell in the church these days, but that's the reality of a life without Christ. But they announced the one who is the great joy that God sent His Son as Redeemer. And Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2 tells us, then lived His sinless life and went to the cross in our place, bearing our sin, enduring the cross. Why? For the joy set before Him, despising the shame, and He has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, and that means he sat down victorious and joyous. Unless we think that's where joy stops, Luke 15 tells us that all of heaven rejoices over even one sinner who repents. In an age of grace, the very atmosphere of heaven is joy. It's unending joy. You can imagine every day we share the gospel with people, we share the good news, the, the, the one who is the joy of life. And they come to Christ, they repent of their sins, they turn from their wicked ways, they embrace the Savior. And all of heaven is in a constant state of party, joy. Godly joy that emanates literally from the throne of God. That will even be true during the seven-year period of time when our Lord reclaims this earth from the usurper Satan by great and terrible judgments known as the tribulation. Revelation chapter 7 reassures us that during that time a vast multitude which no man can number will be saved by the witness of a redeemed nation of Israel and the joy will be unspeakable. Finally, Israel gets it right. They were chosen with Abraham to be a light to the nations, to be a blessing to the entire planet. And that was accomplished through Christ. But Israel itself lost the blessing, didn't they? But during that period, it says, they'll look upon me whom they have pierced, and they'll mourn for me as one mourns for an only son. Paul tells us in Romans 11 that they will all of Israel will be saved. They will blitz the world with the gospel, and billions of people will be saved. And consequently, heaven will rejoice these martyred saints. Immediately they get liquidated during the tribulation, but because the church is non-existent during the tribulation, except for those who come to Christ, they're probably beheaded. We could speculate on that all day, but every one of them ends up immediately in heaven. You know, I remember reading article after article or illustration after illustration of saints who I was reading about missionaries in 1934 who were were martyred during the Boxer Rebellion in China, and there was a gun to the head, and the guy said, are you afraid? And he said, why? Pull the trigger, and I'm in the presence of Jesus. (laughs) What's the problem here? And they did pull the trigger. Both he and his wife. But they were immediately in the presence of Jesus, and that's what will happen to any of us who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. So, ever heaven is a place of joy. There may be one exception for those of you who like to find problems with preachers. There is one exception. You know, there is one half hour when the seventh seal to the title deed of the earth is broken during that time and the final trumpet and bowl judgments of God's wrath, which are just the most awful, awesome, uh, awful things in the Bible, and all of heaven goes silent for half an hour just in contemplation of the awfulness of these judgments that God will pour out upon the earth. Heaven, which is perpetually a place of joy and worship in the presence of the one who is joy itself, falls silent at the mere anticipation of what is about to happen. So awesome are these judgments, but as these Judgments begin to unfold. Revelation 12, 12 once again exhorts us, For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. 
In other words, God has reclaim will reclaim the earth so rejoice in what God is accomplishing even at this point and as mighty apostate Babylon falls to God's judgment we're told to rejoice over her O heaven and you saints and apostles and prophets because God has pronounced judgment for you against her you know there's a day of reckoning there's a day where the playing field is made level This earth won't be going the way it's going forever. It's going towards a climax, and when that climax comes, all of heaven will rejoice when God takes total control of both heaven and earth and everything that goes on. He is in control now, but then it's in Revelation, I think it's 11, 16, he says, Praise God, you have taken your mighty power and have begun to rule. And we rejoice in that, in that day when sin no longer has dominion in this world. Heaven is ever a place of joy and rejoicing because the one who is the source of all true joy resides there and he alone is the real joy giver, the eternal, the everlasting joy giver. Furthermore, at the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19.7 we are told, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. And at that time, the joy of God, the joy of Christ, the joy of His church is consummated once for all forever. In a very glorious feast. You see, the entire account of Scripture is one of joy. Joy that finds its source in the God of joy who joyously created the world and the world of mankind who joyously gave himself for men after they rebelled and sinned against his rule and who will joyously judge the ungodly and bring this age to an end and replace it with an eternity of joy and rejoicing in his presence in the new heaven and new earth. And right now, each of you should probably inside be smiling vigorously. Why do we seem so downcast about what's going on in this world? So downcast at the things that happen in our lives. So downcast, depressed. Depression's a a terrible thing, and it's a terrible thing for a Christian to experience. And yet there's so much cause for joy because we serve a God who is the embodiment of all joy. It's amazing. So I hope you can understand my dismay after reading hundreds of verses in the Bible and reading about the joy of God displayed throughout Scripture that it was never mentioned as one of His main character qualities or attributes. Oh, it was kind of hinted at, you know, speaking of His grace and mercy and love, but... It was not dealt with directly. I went through J.I. Packer's book, his classic book, Knowing God, which is a great book, just because joy is not listed as an attribute, don't not read it. Great, you know, didn't see joy in there listed as an attribute. Went through J.I. Packer's classic, Knowledge of the Holy, and again, joy is not listed as an attribute. I went through A.W. Pink's book on the attributes of God. Again, joy was not listed as an attribute. Three of the best books that there are on the attributes of God, and joy's not mentioned very much. Oh, I would imagine it's in there somewhere, but you'd have to search hard. And yet the entire atmosphere of Scripture is permeated and infused with joy. The joy of the Lord. The joy that is infinite and unending. I'm sure you could come up with books. I'm sure Craig could come up with some that would deal with this issue. But in the main, the fact that God is a God of joy, that one of His main attributes is joyously how He goes about things, is not really emphasized. Now, in the remaining few minutes, let me just sort of capsulize what I found. And it'll be kind of a mishmash between the joy of God and the joy of man and let me just kind of capsulize what I found as I looked up all these references on the joy of the Lord and and just kind of sit back and listen as they're listed in your notes already and I would encourage you in your 
devotional reading this week to look up all those passages on joy that are in the notes. I just listed them out. I didn't write them out or anything. But just go from verse to verse and, and get an idea in your mind what the joy of God is about and what we are to be joyful about in our lives. And I would encourage you to do that as a study this week. I think it will bless your hearts and prepare you for future sermons. To begin with, probably the first 10 or 15 references to joy in the Scripture refer to the joy we experience when we see the mighty hand of God at work. It's very powerful. When you see God at work, I mean, even the angels can't resist. As powerful and as mighty as they are, God's power and might is just displayed in awesomeness and they're awestruck. The thing they're most awestruck about is the salvation of man. Things in which angels long to gain a clear glimpse, 1 Peter 1 tells us. But as you read through the first few references, you see the uniting of the kingdom under David in 1 Peter. Chronicles 12.40, it brought great joy to the, the nation of Israel. The rejoicing over the ark being brought to Jerusalem. First Chronicles 15.16, the joy of giving to build God's temple. David was just amazed at the generosity of the people in First Chronicles 29. He was amazed at the bounty of God through his people and the, the great joy of deliverance from enemies repeatedly under the reign of David in Second Chronicles 20, verse 27. The restoration of the temple worship by Hezekiah. Israel had gone astray. If you read through the kings of, of Judah, you realize that they had like nine out of 17 kings were worth anything. The others were Baal and Ashtaroth work, worshipers, just like all the kings of, of the northern kingdom of Israel. But Hezekiah was one of those godly kings that, that God blessed and, and he, he restored temple worship in 2 Chronicles 29 and, and 29 and 30 and there was great joy over that. He reinstituted the Passover which had not been celebrated for years upon year upon years. In 2 Chronicles chapter 30 verses 21 and 26. And then later on, we see the laying of the foundation of the temple after the Babylonian exile. Nebuchadnezzar and the the Chaldean herds had come in there, just leveled Jerusalem. Apparently, they destroyed the temple. Was no more. Foundation was relayed in Ezra chapter 3. They rejoiced at God's goodness that they had come back to the land and they were allowed to rebuild the temple of God. In fact, the Persian Empire foot the bill, which is cause for great rejoicing. Then you had the dedication of the temple and celebration of the Passover by the returned exiles in Ezra chapter 6 and dedication of the rebuilt walls in Nehemiah chapter 12 and the joy of repentance and turning to the Word of God in Nehemiah chapter 8. Well, I think you get the point. Joy is the emotion that results in the believer's life when there is a repentance a returning, a rededication, a remembering, a reinstating, a recognition or rejoicing in the things of God, the Word of God, or just in God Himself. You know, Nehemiah summed it up when he said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. If you're feeling weak this morning, spiritually, you might take one of those reinstituting, repenting, and see if it applies to your life. See if there's things you used to do that you needed to do. Maybe you've walked away from your first love in a sense. And like he said to the church at Ephesus, he says, I have this little thing against you. You've left your first love in Revelation chapter 2. He says, unless you repent, return, remember, repent, and return, I'm going to remove your candlestick. Maybe there's something like that in your life this morning. Maybe something has taken that place. You know, Sandy and I were just talking about a friend of ours who recently talked to, who's become all, you know, he's an on-fire Christian, now he's all enamored with his business. And you can't hardly talk to him about the Lord anymore. It's just business, business, business. You know, the subject always gets changed when you start talking about the Lord, and now it's business. 
or whatever, and how much money we're making in this deal and that deal and every other deal you can think of. Maybe one of these things needs to apply to us in our relationship with God because God wants us to be joyful. Because the Lord, the joy of the Lord is our strength. So the opposite would, if there's no joy of the Lord, there's no strength. Right? If I'm not rejoicing in God my Savior, then I've got no strength in the Christian life. You know, this is very clear in the Psalms, where it tells us that our joy is in the Lord. Psalms 5, 11, and 12, that at His right hand is fullness of joy. Psalms 16, 11, that victories bring joy from the Lord. You know, don't think of battles uh, like armies coming together and clashing, but think of victories in the sense of temptation, of problems, of financial setbacks, health problems, all those things as God takes you through those problems and shows you that He is powerful and He is mighty, even in the, the problem. Consider it all joy, my brethren, we counter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and endurance perfection. Think of it that way. But the psalmist David tells us that joy in victory, or victory brings great joy in the Lord in Psalms 20, verse 5 and 27, 6. And And he tells us that sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Psalms 30, verse 5. You know, we've all had those times where it looks like the whole world is falling apart, right? When we go to bed, you wake up in the morning and you just go, wow, God's still on the throne, isn't he? You know, even in this, he's still on the throne. Even though I'm facing this trial and, and this problem, he's still on the throne. God is still sovereign. That's where the joy comes in the morning. Because you've had time to think it through and struggle it through, and the only conclusion you can come to is that God is still on the throne. Because the situation hasn't changed. And God hasn't changed. That's the beauty of it. God hasn't changed. And He will deal with you and the situation, and He will bring you through it. Psalms tells us that trust in the Lord brings joy. Psalms 32, verses 10 and 11, that praise and joy are becoming to the upright. Psalms 33, 1 through 4, that that we can rejoice as God prospers us. Psalms 35, 27, that God is my exceeding joy. Psalms 43, 4, that I'm to shout to God with a voice of joy. Psalms 47, 1, for He is the great King over all the earth. Again, you get back to that situation that you know, life, you look at life on this planet and where it's going, it's not encouraging. It's not exciting. It's not, you know, I'm, I'm not wild about ISIS. I'm not wild about what's going on in the Middle East or Russia or in our country. I, I, you, know, you know, those things can be worrisome, right? And bothersome. But God is the great king over all the earth. He's bringing about his purposes both in and through our lives. Psalms 51, 8, and 12 tells us joy, we saw this not too long ago, that joy from God comes after repentance from sin and getting it right with God. You know, there's nothing in the world like knowing you're walking with God and you're walking right. You're doing it the way God says. You know, the man who hears these words of mine and acts upon him be like the guy who built on the rock. There's nothing like building on the rock. And we do that by... Hearing and obeying God's word, don't we? Joy comes from recognizing God as the righteous judge of men. Psalm sixty seven four. Psalms eighty one one tells us tells me to sing for joy to God who is our strength. <laughs> you know, this reminds me of Steve Riley. Sometimes, you know, when we lift weights in the afternoon, a couple days a week. He'll be coming up my driveway and he'll be whistling or singing some song. It's like, what's that? You know, and the dogs start barking and everything. But, you know, it, it's, it's neat to see because it's, that's the joy of the Lord. You ever just kind of broke out in song? You ever kind of just, 
you know, been thinking about something and immediately a song or a psalm or a scripture will pop into your mind and you'll just kind of repeat it out loud or you'll tell it to the person next to you or, you know, that's the joy of the Lord. That's something that's emanating from with inside. You know, Psalms 87.7 tells us all the springs of joy are in God. It's an amazing statement, isn't it? All joy, all the springs and springs of life, the whole every spring there is, every tributary of joy there is, comes from God. Because the best the world can do is happiness. You know, happiness comes from the idea of haphazard. It comes from, actually comes from the word haphazard. You have some haphazard thing happen in your life that you get a new car, you get a new girlfriend, you get a new this, that, other thing, you get a check in the mail. It makes you happy until you spend it or it gets a scratch or, you know, whatever. Somebody keys your car down in Fresno. And then you're not so happy anymore, right? Because that's, hap- that's a haphazard thing that happened that makes you not so happy. But joy is forever. It's sustainable. It's something that emanates from within and it's directly related to the person and work of God. So all joy springs from God Himself, which shows me again that, that one of His great attributes is that he is a God of joy. Psalms 89.12 tells us all creation shouts for joy at God's name. You know, there's sometimes I just swear you can almost see the creation screaming out the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament's His handiwork. And night to night reveals speech and day to day reveals knowledge. I, I think it's in Psalm, it's in, actually in Psalms 19, and I, I hope I didn't misquote it, but that's an amazing thing, isn't it? All of creation shouts for joy at God's name. You know, Psalms 90 verse 14 tells us God's, God's satisfaction brings joy and gladness. Psalms 92.4 tells me I'm to sing for joy as I see the work of His hands. Psalms 95.1, I'm to sing for joy to God, the rock of my salvation. I love that. The rock of my salvation. Psalms 119.111 tells me that the Word of God is to be the joy of my heart. How many of us know we were singing that, open the eyes of my heart, Lord? How many know where that is from? Anybody? Anybody? It's actually in the Scripture, which a lot of music isn't, but kind of alludes to Scripture, but it actually comes from Ephesians 1.18. And you know, as things pop into your mind like that, like it's like you're, you're having a problem, right? And you're dealing with an issue or something. And you just say, Lord, open the eyes of my heart that I might see You, that I might see the solution that You have in mind in this situation. Because I can only see about that far and you see... That far, you see the implications of all of this that's going on in my life. And though I can't really understand it at this point, Lord, open the eyes of my heart that I might see and understand the implications of what You're taking me through that I can live through it. You know, I often pray for people that God would give them the grace to go through whatever they have to go through because we want immediate results. I was just talking to somebody this week and, you know, just one day after a problem, once it fixed. Well, that ain't going to happen usually. Sometimes it does and most of the time it doesn't. God has His timing and He works through things with you, usually to make you the kind of person He wants you to be. You know, because trials work perfection, James tells us. Now, I could go over Isaiah and the prophets, and we would see that it's the joy of the Lord and the joy of His people as they rejoice in God and the Word of God and, and the majesty of God that just permeates and saturates the Old Testament. As Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And, and if that was true in the Old Testament, it's also true in the Gospels and the epistles of the New Testament. Joy is everywhere in the Scriptures. Amazing thing. We should be walking on cloud nine 
every minute of every day. And to put it in those terms, kind of a dumb term, but we should be joyful. We should see this world through God's eyes. We should see the situations that come into our life through God's eyes. We should see people through God's eyes. It might radically transform the way we approach our lives and the way we live. The New Testament is no different. The coming of Messiah brought good news of great joy, Luke 2.10. The message that all of heaven rejoices over even one sinner that repents and enters into the joy of the Savior, Luke 15, verses 7 and 10. The, the message that our joy is made complete and that the joy of the Lord saturates our lives as we learn to love and abide and bear much fruit in our relationship to Jesus, John 15, 11. And then Matthew 25 says, as we live faithfully and we trust Him, as we abide in Him, that we enter into the joy of our Master. And that's heaven. The joy of our Master, right? We enter into His joy and His realm of joy forever. Never to be interrupted. We see those early disciples filled with joy in the Holy Spirit, it tells us in Acts 13.52. Demonstrating the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, Galatians 5.22, to a watching world, showing the, the world, Romans 14.17, that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's to be the church. Demonstrating that righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You know, we may go through rough times. We'll see that persecution and that is also a cause of great joy, depending on what you're being persecuted for, Peter tells us. But, you know, all of life ultimately issues in joy because we serve a God of joy. Paul writes to the Thessalonians who had received the Word of God amidst much much tribulation, but with the joy of the Holy Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 1.6. And later he calls them his joy and crown in the presence of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 2.19. You know, if we looked at people like that, that would really transform it, how we looked at people, wouldn't it? You know, see them as our crown and joy, as the opportunity we have to minister to them and love them and serve them and see them grow in the Lord and disciple them and, and all those kind of things. And, you know, it, it's an amazing thing if we would just look at people like that and someday in the presence of the Lord present them to the Lord and say, here, here they are. These are the people I poured my life into. These are the people I gave your life too as you ministered in and through me. Kind of takes away the self-focus, doesn't it? In 1 Thessalonians 3.9, he thanks God for all the joy and rejoicing he received in ministering to them. You know, I, I think once you start serving the Lord and quit trying to serve yourself and get whatever you can out of whatever you're trying to get it out of, once you start serving other people, it's the most addictive thing in the world because it brings such great joy to your own heart. And instead of just seeing one person's life change, you get to see about 20, 30 people's lives change, and it's a cause of great joy. It's an incredible thing. It's just an amazing thing. You'll never want to stop it once you start it. You know, First Peter 1, 3-9 talks... Talks about, I was talking about the Neronian persecutions and uh, the fiery trials they're going through. And he says, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while you've been tested by various trials. He says, knowing the testing of your faith produces, a, it produces eternal life, essentially. And he talks about our great inheritance. And then he says, in this you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. And man, what could be better than that? You know, no matter how this world goes, you and I have a firm salvation because God is the rock of our salvation. He says He'd never leave us or forsake us. We have heaven to look forward to no matter what happens in this world. 
You know, the writer of Hebrews exhorts the church in Revela- uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, to obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. It says, let them do it with, how? with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. In other words, the church is to be a place of loving obedience resulting in joy. You see, love and joy is to permeate and saturate and mark the ministry of the church because our God is a God of infinite joy. Whether it's relating to one another, whether it's relating to the world, whether it's relating leadership and and those who are following, uh, uh, shepherd and sheep and so on. You know, we need to do it with joy and not with sorrow. And then John, I'll Sum it up here. He sums this all up when he says in 3 John 4, he says, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. You know, I can just imagine John, he's writing these short letters, if you've seen them. 2 and 3 John are real short letters, but they're just power packed. And in 3 John he says, you know, there's nothing more joyous in my life and to see those I love walking in the truth. It's the ultimate for me. And I would echo those words. Now, if that's what brought the greatest amount of joy to the heart of the Apostle Paul or John, imagine the joy it brings to the heart of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just imagine that when... when he says in John fifteen eleven, he says, These things I have spoken to you that my joy, which is an infinite joy, may be in you, and your joy may be made complete. That's powerful, isn't it? And how does that happen? Well, it happens through you and I not only hearing, not only believing, but then acting upon the Word of God. And he promises his joy, the joy of the Holy Spirit, through the Spirit is love, joy, peace, will be in you, and that your joy would be made complete. How many of you could use a good dose of joy? Anybody? What? <laughs> this is the, uh, the coup de grace right here. You see, joy permeates the entire length and breadth of the Bible the Word of God, but the greatest joy you and I can bring to the heart of our joy-filled God is to believe and walk in His truth. And as we do that, our Father is glorified as we bear much fruit and so prove to be His disciples, John fifteen eight. And this is how we bring God joy. This is how we give Him glory. Simply by hearing the Word of God, by believing it, and by putting it into practice by the way we walk and the way we live and the way we think, the way we view things, the way we approach problems, the way we approach people, the way we minister to our families, the way we minister in the church, the way we worship, the way we sing, the way we do everything. God is seeking people to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And you can't worship Him in spirit without the joy of the Holy Spirit, can you? You can't worship Him in truth without the, the Word of God. You know, I once <laughs> encountered this lady that was, I ought to say she was very annoying. <laughs> and she kept coming after me and, and after me, and, and she said, you guys got the truth and we've got the Spirit. And I said, that is impossible. Can't happen. Just can't happen. You cannot have the truth without the Spirit, and you can't have the Spirit without the truth. So why are you making this dichotomy between the two? When I worship God in spirit and in truth, that's the essence of giving God joy. Let's pray.